Oh, feel the power. Oh, I can feel it. Our moment of triumph approaches. <laughs> The Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. You have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Flashback. Uh, we will have to talk to the proprietor of the office space and go, which hole do we use? Yeah, I hate, I hate it when you have to say that. The um... <laughs> We should go back, I think, so talking of college, to the scheme whereby not only do the parents help their kids, but there are no government subsidies, and let the colleges compete for the best kids by offering scholarships to those that are the best kids. That's crazy talk. <laughs> There's Steve always with the smart remark. That will work, too. That's why they won't do it. It'll work. You know, at their core. I mean, society can scope. Right, so about three squirrels ago. <laughs> GraniteRock.com is a product of GraniteRock.com. Grok Talk is a product of GraniteRock.com. I'm not <laughs> I just love this idea of how they're going to go to a bourbon festival or several bourbon festivals in Kentucky because that's where the young people go. So first we'll get them drunk, and then we'll hook them onto Obamacare. What a country! As the old uh, Russian poet Pushkin said, where there is a trough, there will be pigs. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, you guys have a great sense of humor. I mean, no matter how much ribbon I do, even that uh, airbrush marine you have there, he, he, no matter how much uh, ribbon I give you guys, you guys always, you always come back for more, and you're always polite. And, you know, I go to the liberal websites where I have a lot of fun haranguing them, and uh, <laughs> they really get their panties in a wad. And I'm always, I'm always getting kicked off, and I have to make a new name, and uh, it's brutal. <laughs> Yeah, it, and they're wrong. Yeah, she, it's almost like saying their crap don't stink. I was about to say that say the same thing. Their poop don't stink, but you know, <laughs> that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Here on Grok Talk, we have crap, we have poop, we have monster trucks. Okay, <laughs> we have we're coming pretty that, close but, to the but, end of this segment. Good, that, good. But, uh, that, yeah, but, things but, are deteriorating. But, Grok Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrok.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, The Rock, NHCR.com. Grok Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Rock Talk. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. The 603 Alliance held its second training seminar on Tuesday, August 11, 2015 at St. Anselm's Institute of Politics. And despite the heavy storms throughout the area, the turnout was fantastic. After introductions and a brief overview of who the 603 Alliance and CVL New Hampshire LLC are, the training focused on the first in the state 603 Grassroots Presidential Caucus to be held on Saturday, October 17, 2015 at the Hopkinton Fairgrounds. Procedures for the caucus were discussed and a call to action for volunteers to help on event day was met with great enthusiasm. Almost everyone volunteered to help, and thanks to our wonderful friends from Massachusetts who have offered their assistance as caucus marshals. If you could not make the training seminar this week and would like to volunteer your time, please download the GPS Caucus sign-up form available at 603alliance.org. There are instructions on the site for where to send the form. 
Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk. Brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Talk. Hey, welcome back. Everything's working this week. Everything's working so good. We have guests. We have... We have everything. It's, it's pretty all kinds of awesome. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is Grok Talk. I'm Steve McDonald here with Skip Murphy and Mike Rogers. Uh, our guests today include our uh, monthly Ed segment with Jorge Mesa Tejati. We're going to talk about uh, some doings in Sandville, Sandown and Danville. We just call it Sandville. And uh, RSA 21J. We're going to have Rick Olson back. We're going to talk about the NRA stickers and hoplophobes issue. We heard a little bit about that. that. I post. don't even hear you for some reason. Why is that? There we go. How's that? Yeah, that was great. And the guy who he was commenting on took down his uh, post. Did he? Yes. Uh, we also have Max Abramson. Uh, Max is coming in. We haven't talked to him in a while. Uh, he is preparing some material for the uh, for Veto Override Day for HB 603, which is, I believe, parental opt-outs for testing. It's all about parental notification. Correct. Okay, parental notifi- oh, parental notification. Parental responsibility is better put. All right, Kimberly Morin's at Jackson Hole, Wyoming, at an uh, at a, an economic summit. We're going to have her call in, and and uh, we'll talk to her. And we might just also talk to uh, Stella Morbido, who's a senior writer at the Federalist, and recently put up an excellent piece that that we'll get to um, shortly. We don't know. Uh, we had a tight schedule with her. We weren't sure if we were going to be able to squeeze her in. She said, "You know what? Give me the number. If I can call you, I'll call you." And uh, that'll be later on in the show. But until so we get then, to watch Ed, Ed Lasky, our flasher. Ed will be Ed will be flashing perhaps sometime right after ten thirty. So, but we're going to call Kimberly and get an update from Jackson Hole, and then we're going to leave her on the line. She's going to join us in the conversation if uh, Stella has a chance to call. Yippee! Yay! So great week. Don't forget uh, if you want to listen to this or past programs, you can do so on Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, and iTunes. We are also on YouTube, Ustream, and now on the rockandhcr.com, supposedly streaming right now, and rebroadcast at 7 p.m. on Monday night. You can also check us out on Facebook and Twitter, and we encourage you to do so. We're and everywhere. We are, we're, and I'm working on another one, working on another one. So, uh, And I also wanted to let you know that hopefully within a couple of weeks I'll have had my, um, my Shiite together, and I'll be able to do a news read in the first segment, the first five minutes, because I have to do that because some of these radio stations have to do news. So Getting in order your- for them to do their news, they do their news over our feed, and then they pick us up at five after. So I have to fill five minutes, and right now we're just kind of throwing some junk out there to fill the five minutes, but I want to do a news read, and maybe we'll all do a news read. Maybe so we'll all bring in a story, and we'll just read stuff for the first five minutes, and blah, blah, blah. And But I have a question for you. If you're saying you're trying to get your Shiite together, does that mean we're going to be broadcast live from a mosque? We might. I don't know if they'll let us. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe if we take some pamphlets, they'll let us. <laughs> but what are we going to do about our commenter, Chris P. Bacon? We'd have to leave him outside. Yeah, they won't They won't like that bacon no. thing. So. No. No bacon. <laughs> anyway, no. Um, we have a few minutes before we call Jorge at quarter after. It is 9.08 a.m. Eastern, 9.09 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we have about uh, five minutes. And you had made some suggestions for the uh, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot of the week. I did. I did. You know, one, you. One of the, and it all comes back to our wonderful, magnificent three-letter agency at the federal level called the EPA. They, they struck twice. Um, let's do the macro and then a more micro version of it. The macro level is that they had tried under the, the Clean Water Act, as all bureaucracies, especially under Obama, have tried to do, is to expand their reach and expand their authority, which means that you lose your freedom and they're more intrusive. Um, they were supposed to, oh, yeah, I can switch that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, oh is it you're still waving to Jane. I'm waving to Jane. Oh, no, I'm okay. not just waving at the camera. Oh, okay. Hi, so, Jane. So anyways, they're supposed to have these puddles supposedly on your yard. You know, if you get mm-hmm. – like on my yard, I'm on a hill. 
Water from the mountaintop like kind of runs and down and, through, yeah. and it goes through this little bit of a swale in my backyard. Well, according to the EPA, I can't touch that anymore unless I get their permission, and I have to have an engineer come in, and I have to pay their fees, and then I have to have the inspectors and everything else. And in effect, the EPA is federalizing my land. It's no longer my personal property. So quick, well, quick 13, before, the, before the puddle forms, yeah, you dig yourself a drainage trench and fill it with gravel. Can't, can't do it. Not anymore, because uh, there was a lawsuit, 13 states, Supreme Court said, that's right, I mean, a lower court said, you ha- we're putting a stay on this. Well, the EPA said and decided to take, instead of using this as a national decision, they're, they're being obstinate, they're stonewalling, they're saying, well, that just means that it's only for these 13 states that sued that we can't do it. We're going to do it everywhere else in the nation. And, of course, Democrat New Hampshire didn't join the suit. No, it did not. Sorry, so, Democrat chaired New Hampshire. Yeah, so if you get even really even a puddle, a, a drainage ditch that you might see full of water on a once-in-a-hundred-year storm, the EPA is going to be living in your house, and you won't even know it. Now, going to the micro. There's a guy out in Wyoming, owns a big farm. He decided, this is my property, I pay the taxes, I pay the mortgage, I run a farm. He wanted to build a holding pond, which he did. He followed all the rules for Wyoming and the locals, did everything that he was supposed to. And then, having gotten all of those blessings, the EPA came along and said, you have to remove that. We don't care what the state says, we don't care what the locals say. And we're going to charge you uh, 37... yeah, million dollars, yes. No, Thirty-seven thousand dollars a day until you get this. So now the amount's up to sixteen million dollars, and the guy is finally saying, "I, you know, where are we in the United States? Where it's my private property? I put in a holding tank or pond for my farm, and the federal government says I can't do that. Whatever happened to the?" And these are my words. Whatever happened to one of the things that drove the American Revolution? One was the rule of law. Everyone was equal to the law. <clears throat> and in the Declaration, the pursuit of happiness was originally the pursuit of property. And in the New Hampshire Constitution, it is the property that Get is. Get used to this. Hello? Yeah, we're from the EPA. You left a Frisbee in your yard. There's water in it. it almost. <laughs> almost. But, but then the local health officials might say, get rid of that because it's a breeding ground for mosquitoes. So, mm-hmm. They anyways. can fight with the EPA. Yeah. So anyways, the, once, this is the second big level court fest that's going to go on because there was another case earlier where the EPA said, you can't appeal to the court systems. You can only appeal to us because we told you you have to fill in this grassland just because you um, built a house there. They had to sue, spent over a million dollars to sue the EPA to be able to win in court, to be able to get the decision that, yes, I can sue the EPA in court. This is what happens when you get the administrative state, when you get an agency and unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats that believe they can rule your life. I mean, we're, be- we're no better than subjects under King George. You have George. to post signs that say this is a federal agent-free zone. The state of New Hampshire is a sovereign state. This is my Sorry. property, and trespassers will be... Well, will be repelled with whichever force necessary. All right, we're going to call Jorge. Uh, you guys hang on for a few minutes, listen to some interesting music, add some promos, and we'll be right back with Mr. Mace Tejada. Stay tuned. This Whatever. coalition of New Hampshire taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Rock Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrock.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrock.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, The Rock NHCR.com. Rock Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, 
or smartphone. Rock Talk. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. The Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Trying to get Jorge on the line. Working on it, working on it. I'll read this while I'm waiting. Shane dropped it off. Planned Parenthood requesting additional funding. Planned Parenthood has submitted an August 5th Executive Council request for 16% funding from the taxpayers of New Hampshire. What makes this financial request even worse is this New Hampshire funding is going toward Vermont officials' salaries. This request includes funding of Planned Parenthood New England's grant writer as well as a medical director at a salary of $208,000. Is it time for Planned Parenthood to take its hands out of the New Hampshire taxpayer's pocket? I'd say it is. It is interesting to note that while Planned Parenthood may be limiting hours because of the New Hampshire Executive Council's recent vote to decline further New Hampshire taxpayer funding, their 2014 audit and 2014 990 tell a very interesting tale. These audits show Planned Parenthood is spending $1 million on fundraising and $1.5 million on public policy influencing. Planned Parenthood, I got it, I'm reading. What? That's not it. What are you doing? Stop it. Get away from my board. Damn it. Hey, Jorge. How you doing? Fine, thank you. Skip is, Skip is, <laughs> Skip is messing with my board. No, oh, we had donations to pay for this board. Oh, this is my board stuff. Listen, don't touch any buttons unless you're sitting in this chair. Don't touch his junk. Don't touch my junk. <laughs> um, I gotta find out where. We're... Hi, Jorge. How you doing? I am fine, thank you. We're having a little spat. Don't worry. <laughs> I know. I get. I, I keep getting the problems trying to get you calling here too. I don't know why. Uh, okay. So anyway, we wanted to talk about um, what did I write down? Uh, Sandown and Danville, Timberlane. Yeah. And then yeah. RSA 21J. 21J. Okay. The, the first one, the Sandown and Danville issue, was a suit that the um, selectmen of two towns uh, uh, asked for a restraining order from the court to stop Timberlane from uh, using the Sandown Central School for special education center after town meeting or the, or the annual meeting decided to remove funding for those schools. What happened was our illustrious superintendent, Harold Metzler, decided that, yeah, that's true, no is no, and no, the Santa Central cannot be reopened because, you know, people said no. But if you change the name, then you can do it. So... <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it's this. not called Sandown Central anymore. We're going to open it. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's going to be a special education center. Okay, that was that was the basis of, as to what happened. So the selectman said, "Hold it a minute, Sandown and Danville. They figure now. This is the towns. Keep that in mind. Uh, since we provide the money, we don't want to furnish. We want to withhold that money until the court tell, tells us that we have to do it. There is a problem." That suit never got to first base. The judge dismissed it on the opening sentence, like he should, because the towns, ha- as corporate entities, have no standing before the school board, another uh, school district, another corporate entity. The only ones who have standing to sue the school district are the members of the legislative body, namely the voters, not the selectmen as officials. That's interesting. And, that, and that's what I wanted to point out to everyone because it's a very common situation. The school board, the school district, and the town are two separate political corporations. The town is a political corporation, and there are, say, 31 colon 1. Every town is a body corporate and politic, and by its corporate name may be sued and be sued, prosecuted and defend in any court or elsewhere. Okay. And they, but they, and they are the ones who can own, They are the only ones who can tax and collect revenue. Okay, the school boards, uh, the 
school districts vote the annual budget and then send that to selectmen to collect. The, the, the school district cannot collect money. They don't have taxing authority, okay? And, um, and specifically, the town is authorized by 31 Ford may at any legal meeting grant and vote such sums of money as they judge necessary for any purpose for which a municipality may act if such appropriation is not prohibited by the laws or constitution of the state. Okay. The district is also a corporation, 194 colon 2. Each town shall constitute a single district for school purposes, 194.2. All districts legally organized shall be corporations with power to sue and be sued to hold and dispose of real and personal property for the use of the schools therein and to make necessary contracts in relation thereto. Almost the same language as the towns. So that that's what here you have the the the, um, the big difference between the two. But now you got to one ninety four seven assessment. The selectman shall annually assess upon the rateable state of the district a sum equal to the amounts determined by the district and shall pay over the same to the district pressure. If they fail, they are guilty and they can be they can be fined. The selectmen have no recourse but to, to tax, collect the money and send it over to the school district. So the point that I'm trying to make is a very common mistake of people, taxpayers to think that uh, the, the uh, town can sue the school district and the school district can sue the town. Uh, uh, you know, for actions totally not under their purview. That's why the judge dismissed the, the uh, situation, regardless of the merit of, of the uh, of the of the petition. Do you know if any um, any taxpayers are planning to sue? Uh, they they ask for a, at this point. What they ask is for a reconsideration. So we're there now. Because the the, uh, the judge said, you know, he he would welcome any uh, any situ- any uh, articles or, or briefs if they felt that he had made or misinterpreted any of the uh, uh, shall I say articles or arguments that, that had been presented. So that's where we are right now. So hey. right now, the answer is no. You cannot do it. You have no you have no standing. Hey Jorge. Yep. This is Skip, and thanks for coming on the show. Uh, just listening to what the Earl of Metzler has done in the past, um, this is more of a case of it's, he's not so much misinterpreting the law, he's using it as a smokescreen and just basically acting like he was a micro-present King George the Third. He just wants, well, actually he's aping the idea of what Obama has been doing, which is I want what I want, and I want it when I want it, and I'm going to do it now because that's when I want it now kind of deal, right? Exactly. And, and what, what happens is that the uh, superintendents and the school administrations, since they have an unlimited legal budget almost, they, they can really bamboozle the uh, taxpayers into anything they want. And because of the ignorance of the taxpayers, they get away with it. Yes, like Obama has been getting away with an awful lot, like our WTF moments of this morning, where, again, Obama's EPA is just doing what it wants. But is there anything else besides just renaming the school and saying, I don't care what's gone on, we're just going to do it anyways, which, you know, that kind of thing has happened up in my town of Guilford, where the voters said, we're not going to do full day kindergarten, and the district decided to do it anyways. Oh, that's different. In this particular case, it, it, it was the, the issue that he wanted to close Sandown Central uh, to save money, okay? On the one hand, that's what came before the annual meeting. And then after the annual meeting, he says, oh, no, we're going to use the buildings for to consolidate special education for the district. Don't forget, Timberlane is a regional school district that consists of four towns. So that's what he's doing. He He... He said, okay, I'm not sense letting that, that building go to waste because we still have to maintain it. So we're going to repurpose it. And therefore, it's no longer subject to any anxious actions of the uh, of the uh, annual meeting. And yes, we have money in the budget. Sure, they have. They, they always carry about a 2 to $4 million surplus. You know, and this is the kind of thing where you keep worrying about the strong man when it comes to politics or in government. Where 
you get people like this who believe they are above the rest. It's typically the progressive model. I know what's best for you, or in this case, I know what's best for the town. I've got your money already, so I'm just going to do it. And, oh, by the way, there's nothing you can do to stop me. I mean, what's the feeling of the taxpayers that you come in contact with uh, about this type of deal? Or is it a case, once again, where not enough people even know what's going on and they don't care because it doesn't affect them at the moment? That, from what I see, from what I sit here, there is a lot of traffic in, in Facebook and otherwise uh, pro and con. And, uh, but people are primarily incensed that the, the, the superintendent is behaving like you said, like a little Hitler. You know, and instead of being open about it and saying, okay, this is what we plan to do if we close it, he, that he should have disclosed before the annual meeting, as opposed to after the meeting, then, then they're, they're in the sense that they feel powerless. So they're now they're trying to every which way to see how they can, uh, shall I say, curtail or or restrict his actions so that they don't get you know part of my language screwed again. Is anybody now, launching uh, right to know requests about this? And oh. oh, oh, oh! The first thing he did when he came on board was to institute a $1 per page fee on any right to know request. We never had that. Never. So now he has stymied that, and then he, he, he has all sorts of, he put all sorts of obstacles to get the information. Uh, it, it, that's another story. Yeah, I mean, the right to know request, that's how it all began. We began to get an awful lot of information. But, but, uh, and, but then he really put a stop to that. In other words, he tried to cure and help. Don't forget. He came from Quincy. He was a principal in Quincy, Massachusetts. And my, uh, Massachusetts politics are totally different from New Hampshire. He had no experience so much. better in New Hampshire. <laughs> okay, and like, I, like I say to myself, jokingly, I said, good thing there is no bay next to Plasta. Otherwise, I would wear a life jacket whenever I go down to uh, <laughs> KU. So, uh, you know, obviously they, they've come after you, Jorge, but other than you... Has uh, do you see the rest no, of the school I, I board? Have no, I have no standing. I'm in Hampstead. I'm getting this from the from the people, the activists. Yeah, you know, Donna Green and company in Timberland. Yeah. Now, now, question: What's the school board doing about this? Or are they just basically where you know the same thing that they we see all over the place? Where the school board basically is the lap dog, lap dog, and the rubber stamp for the superintendent. You got it. That's exactly it. Great. The Timberlane School Board has circled the wagons, and they are protecting him any which way, and they are trying to squash anything that Donna Green, a member of the, of the school board, or her husband, who was a former member of the uh, budget committee, <clears throat> come out because they come out with, with – they are the ones who have been digging out all this dirt. Yeah, it's uh, – if you go to uh, um, Donna Green's blog, I believe it's um – uh, I forget the name of it now. Sandown Danville or something. Uh, it, uh, just search Donna Green. You'll find her. She's uh, got a great blog. I mean, she is just on top of everything there. She reports everything that happens, and it's pretty impressive. we got to go, Jorge. Um, thanks for coming on and explaining that to us. We missed the best one. Do you have, do you have a, a minute? I don't. I have about 10 seconds. Okay. <laughs> but we have, a, we have the better part to go yet about SAU not being subject to audits. All right, we'll bye, get to bye, that bye. next time then. Thanks a lot. Bye. See ya. Have a good weekend. Bye. You too. Bye bye. All right, Jorge's. Thank you very much. Hopefully, we'll get to this other thing. Maybe we'll have them on next weekend. We're going to be right back with Rick. Hang on. This is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Grok Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrok.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, The Rock and HCR.com. Grok Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere 
anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Rock Talk. Another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. We are... Rock Talk brought to you by GraniteRock.com and the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. Check them out at cnht.org to see how they help municipalities and taxpayers interface in a as unhostile now. Well, you know, it depends. Depends on what's going on. Uh, check out the voter fraud stuff. Great, great stuff. Probably going on in your town. Probably going on in your city. Probably going on in your state. You don't see it. Go to cnht.org and read it, and then go find it because it's there. I trust you. Trust me, it's there. Absolutely, you'll find all this stuff there. Yeah. The and, outrage. And Ed is hooked into the group that just found out that in 141 counties across this nation, there are more people registered to vote in each and every one of those 141 counties than there are people alive in that county. So tell me, is there voter fraud? There's voter see fraud. Oh, no. A- There's no voter fraud in New Hampshire. No. no. The Democrats say so. That's true. Must be true. And, so, you're, um, and you're saying that with a straight face. <laughs> Thanks again to Jorge. No, there's no. There's no vote fraud. There's no vote fraud. They'll tell you there's no vote fraud. Well, there's no ah. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence that says otherwise, but, oh, that's administrative. That's not voter fraud. Right. That's just, in administrative just, snafus. Yeah. <laughs> just, just like um, there's no videos of Planned Parenthood either. Right, right. Yeah, those were, those were rigged. Those were staged like the moon yep. landing. Yep. They, yeah, they, they're creative editors, you know. Everybody's yeah. lying except them. <laughs> yeah, this is what we've heard ever since um, James O'Keefe started doing this, that they always yell at the short form ones. And then he always, a couple of days later, puts out the full forms. Yep. And Planned Parenthood really thinks that it's going to discredit them. And by the way, I haven't put it up yet, but James O'Keefe now has video of Hillary's campaign. Oh, that ought I to be i got to put that up. That's awesome. Yeah, that's most excellent. But we're not here to talk about that. No. We're no. here to talk about hoplophobes and hoplophobes. NRA stickers. And, yes. And, so, and, and, and a hoplophobe and, is, Rick, to, for, for those who don't know the long words? So a hoplophobe, hoplo being the Greek word for weapon, phobe being fear, it's a person that has an irrational and unfounded fear of, of guns or firearms or weapons for that matter. And you so. had a great post about one who uh, is exactly that. Who, by the way, since I went searching last night, has taken down his Yes, he site. has. He has. He's taken it completely down. Um, and, and that's a shame, too, because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> first I want to say about this blog, he's, he's a writer for a newspaper, some of these not-so-big-but-bigger-type newspapers, mm-hmm. sports writer, I guess. And he put out this rant, and, you know, just to give you a sampling of of what he wrote, (coughs) he basically stated, uh, uh, you know, he makes a lot of uh, assertions by, uh, he says, by displaying that NRA decal on the rear window of your car, you're endorsing violent death. Well, I, I, they're not assertions, uh, Rick. They're assumptions. In no, they're they're uh, assertions because they're based. They're not based in fact, and it's born out of emotion. Definitely an assertion. Well, well, yeah. Well, yeah. He's making assertions, but he's also making assumptions about the uh, the person with the sticker, and we all know what assume does. Right. Well, you know, it, I'm reading the blog, and I'm thinking to myself, well. That's not even worth my time and effort. But first, before I go on, I want to congratulate the city of Concord, New Hampshire. Bravo! Bravo! I mean, you now match South Boston with parking (laughs) and construction issues. Congratulations. What a feat. What an honor. So anyways, back to the subject. And making it impossible to park in front of our studio because now they've got two-hour restrictions anytime but, I, it, it's, but it's pretty. I parked two two blocks away. 
What are all these people doing here on a Saturday morning? <laughs> what the hell are they doing? What is there? Everything's closed. What are you doing? You're just coming around. Oh, I'm going to walk around. Okay, whatever. You know, I don't get it. I mean, when you can beat Match Vegas on parking issues, you have arrived. Mm. Definitely arrived. That's true. That's true. So, Viva Match Vegas. They've actually gotten their prob- their parking issues well under control. You go to the Verizon Wireless Arena, you have some major player there. Yeah. There's actually enough parking. Yep. But, I, I mean, they don't have anything like that up here, and, and their parking sucks. What's up with that? You know? Well, it, once again, we're seeing another phase of urban planners, such as Concord is urban. The apparatchik. Yeah, deciding what is going to be best. And, right. And, you know, every single time they do this, they go after 20 years and going, well, that didn't work out too well, did it? You know, and here in the age of... Give us another couple million dollars and we'll screw it up again. Yeah. Well, you'll notice, Different from the last time we screwed you'll it notice up. notice that the actual productive shops have moved to side streets and back streets where people can still get to them and the yuppie, worthless shops like vapor <laughs> salons yes. that, that are now on the front row where nobody will be able to get to them either because of the parking. So right. with a bit of luck, the right people will go out of business. And how many plastic cut flower shops do you really need in downtown, you know, Concord? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> but anyways, back to the hoplophobe. Back to the hoplophobe. You know, I looked at this blog, you know, and I, I was one of the ones – they got the early on, you know, when the... And you when, show up in Google, by the way. Oh, I do? Yeah. Oh, good, good. So That's even better, <laughs> you know. So so basically, you have this blog out there, right? And I showed up at a point where it was still up and the comments were up. And I read the blog and I went, ooh, got to read the comments, you know. So I scrolled down and he was taking some pretty good abuse from it, you Did know. Did you happen to screen capture that? No, I didn't. Because, oh, again, dang. I was at the point where I'm going... Why am I wasting my time on this? But then as I scrolled down through the comments, I saw a state legislature show up and start saying things like, I feel your pain, you know, and I went, "Uh uh-oh, okay, (sighs) it just got real. So I I actually copied the blog. And here's the thing, too. Uh, On Facebook, I actually contacted the author, and we had a conversation back and forth. Okay. And one of the things that I'm careful to do in a circumstance like that is to be absolutely polite. And I said, I read your blog about, you know, NRA members that have their stickers being a threat. I need you to bear in mind, you're probably talking about one of your family members, one of your relatives. Yeah, and you said that in your post. I did, I did. And I said, also, you're talking about yourself because the people, a lot of the people that have these stickers are just like you. There's not much different about them than, than you. Yeah, they're just like you. They have families and mortgages. I also said that in the post. But, you know, he talks about, you know, he tries to be, it's not not a rational blog. It all comes from viscera, from within. It's not grounded in fact. Like, I'll give you a quote. I see the NRA decal on the rear window of my car and my eyes narrow. I look back at you. I look at the back of your head in the driver's seat, and I wonder if you are a threat. A threat to my children, a threat to me, a threat to society. Really? Really? That's Charlotte and Ray. This, you know. this guy doesn't even rise to the level of being a beta male. Does he know no. a lot of cops no. are trained by the NRA? <laughs> well, yeah. NRA has <laughs> the largest does he give a law clue? enforcement training. The people in, who's, in, who he empowers to be weaponized yeah. and to defend his son and his family are NRA members. NRA is the largest provider of law enforcement training. They are also... The largest provider of grants and funding, 501c3, the NRA Foundation, to do things like build ranges, do Eddie Eagle gun education programs. The Eddie Eagle program is very, it's not, it hasn't grabbed on around here, but it's very popular in the Midwest. And it, what it is, it's a program, it doesn't involve guns at all. It's what do you see if you, what do you do, kids, if you see a gun, go tell somebody, don't touch it, that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and just for our listeners, we here are all NRA members, except i got to renew my membership. I'm yeah. a life member. Yeah. So, oh, maybe I should do that so I don't have to remember any of it. You should. Yeah. There you go. But anyways. Do they still send a you reason? to mail? Oh, well, yeah. Well, they don't <laughs> send me mail anymore because, you know, in the interest of disclosure, I'm the chairman of the uh, the Friends of NRA that funds the NRA Foundation in Rockingham County. I'm a NRA certified club leader. 
Um, I'm an NRA certified pistol instructor, firearms instructor. So they, they said, he's doing enough. Let's stop sending him mail. So they don't send me a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, but, but you know, and when you read stuff like this, you go, this is definitely a person who has decided to outsource his own personal responsibility to somebody else. And even worse, from my viewpoint of what a father and husband should be, has outsourced the responsibility of his family to some faceless bureaucrat who happens yeah. to work in government. Well, here's what I responded to him with that, you know, a threat to my children, a threat to me, a threat to society. I have a picture of Gilda Radner when she, you remember when she was on Saturday Night Live doing the monsters in the closet thing? Mm -hmm. Well, remember when you were a kid and you got scared because you thought monsters were hiding in the closet or under your bed? I remember when I was a kid, I sometimes slept in my bed with my knees cocked up in my abdomen because I feared snakes in my bed. This is the adult version of those fears. Some anxieties never change, only the things we're anxious about. Zoloft is now commonly prescribed for this. <laughs> so that was my response to him, you know. And, uh, you know, he talks about, you know, the NRA. He says, I see a news report about the latest shooting deaths in the United States. I brace myself for the NRA talking points on social media. I try not to read them. I fail at that. I am appalled, saddened, and sickened. Not just sickened, but appalled and saddened, you know, and angry. I am reminded why I consider you a potential threat. Well, here's the thing. Ironically, the NRA doesn't come out with talking points, and they don't have press conferences in the wake of these shooting tragedies. They're actually quite silent, you know. But but how, how do you come out as responsive? Because uh, NRA speaks only when such solipsism, favorite word of the day, begins to gravitate to the policy forum. Yet when the NRA is silent... The charlatans and hoplophobes line up to call out the NRA on their silence. And then when they speak, they seethe hiss, contempt upon every word spoken. I mean, so, I mean, that tells you everything you need to know right there. This is probably the most egregious viewpoint that I see is that anybody who has a gun is automatically to be branded a criminal, is automatically yep. to be branded medically unworthy, who is... Uh, already judged to be mentally incompetent. Of course, they say that about just being a plain conservative anyways. But you, you see this mentality by progressives that and, – and it's almost cognitive dissonance because while they berate us for what we carry on our persons to protect ourselves, I watch them – like in the, the uh, case of Brendan Ike, they have no problem – dealing out vitriol to force somebody out of a position because of a political belief. Right. So here they are lambasting for a potential that, for the most part, never happens. But yet they themselves, as a group, have no problem in using every single tool at their disposal to effectively destroy somebody's life. And yet this guy is saying, you guys with NRA stickers on your cars... Yeah, I'm, I'm so courageous. I refuse to put one on my car because my wife would browbeat me for putting a sticker on my car. So th there you go. Yeah. But, you know, I'm sorry, but there's no consistency. There's also no logic to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, people, people do die. Half the deaths, however, are by uh, suicides. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Most of these suicides would still be suicides by some other means. Suicide by some other means. The other thing is, is let's count up all the all the gang bangers in Chicago and L.A. MS-13 that are shooting each other over turf wars and drugs. You yeah, know? and, I, I, and I you're mean, absolutely right. And, and, and shooting the nine-year-old girls doing their homework as yeah, exactly. they go by. Exactly. Where where do, when do Black Lives Matter exactly? You know, when some thug gets blown away by a, a white cop, yeah, yeah, Black Lives Matter. But we don't hear a peep out of him when the nine-year-old's sitting there doing the homework so let, and a gangbanger so yeah. does a drive-by and shoots her. So let us be clear. The only black lives that matter to the hucksters like Al Sharpton are the thugs that get obliterated. Absolutely. All right, on that note, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with Rick Olson. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. This is Crock Talk. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org.
Grok Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrok.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, The Rock and HCR.com. Grok Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Rock Talk. New Hampshire's leading fire-breathing, hard-charging, gun-toting, outspoken, rebel-rousing, freedom-loving bloggers who have a TV studio in a box. And uh, that's what we are. And we are the safest podcast in New Hampshire. A tad bit more safer with Rick here. Absolutely. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm Steve yes, Donald I here am with, uh, <laughs> Rick is one yes. of the most highly accomplished armed persons in New Hampshire. And uh, Skip Murphy and Mike Rogers... Richard Olson talking to us about uh, Carter Gaddis, the hoplophobe, who has since taken his website down. And, yeah, what, he's right. ad, what he's actually done is he's marked it private. Exactly. You've got to log in. You've got to be invited by him because those nasty gun supporters might insult him otherwise. Yes, his URL is dadscribe.com. Yes. Well, you know, I think what happened was is he was sitting at the table, and now he's been taken down so you can't see him because he's under the table. (laughs) Yeah, big time, big way. Big, brave guy. Big, brave guy. Somebody challenges him, and he's like, I ran away. Uh, He's like the the reporters for that newspaper in southern New York State where – they published the map of all the oh, uh, yes. of all the gun license owners. Right. Uh, they didn't turn out so brave when James O'Keefe's crew showed up on their lawns asking them to take a gun-free zone sign for their own houses. They wouldn't do it. They no. wouldn't do it. Yes. No. So you know. you know, he's perfectly. As I wrote under your post. He's perfectly free to live in his gun-free zone as long as he's uh, as, as long as he'll advertise the fact sure. because the criminals love gun-free zones. And meanwhile, the rest of us will, uh, will will cling to our arms and have low crime in our neighborhoods. Yeah, I, you know, question it, for you, quick, Rick. Yeah. The the Milwaukee County Sheriff, and I can't remember his David name. Clark. Yes, had came out the other night where Obama said, you know, we need more gun oh, yeah. laws. It's gone viral. Yes, and he basically said, okay. With your bodyguards, get rid of their guns and see how the rest of us live. I throw down that challenge to you. What do you think of of that whole situation there in context of uh, Mr. Gaddis? Well, I think David Clark is a great American, and I am also in, want to include in that list uh, Detroit Police Chief Craig. Yes. Okay. Because here we go. You know, D- Detroit, number you know the ha- highest murder rate in the United States, and so what does the police chief do? Okay, arm that's yourselves. it. I've had enough. <clears throat> Time to take a gun course, buy guns, arm yourself. Guess what? Violence is down 12% in a very short period of time. But, you know, the liberals will be the first to tell you there's no causal link between, you know, violence, go, crime going down and more people having guns. There's right. no link. So I'm, you know? so, I'm, so I'm the first to say. Unless that, you're in Plano, Texas. That, yes, <laughs> exactly. So, so, let's, so let's put Black Lives Matter in its proper place. Not what Al uh, Sharpton says. What the Supreme Court said. What the Supreme Court said was the poor black guy in a crime-ridden neighborhood in D.C. C. Heller. I, Heller had the right to own a gun and carry it and defend himself. Yep. And, the, and the town of D.C. still tries to make it they difficult. They still resist. Yeah. yeah well, and, you know. And then there was McDonald in Chicago. Yep. McDonald versus uh, Chicago. Wasn't he a black guy as well? Yep. Yep. Uh, those lives do no matter. relation. Well, we might I, be related, I would I like know. to see. I would like to see every black parent, okay. uh, especially those over forty, in in these inner cities, armed, subsidized, even. Sure. Because boy, oh boy, the gangbangers had run, run off somewhere else. You know, one of the things you can tell that he's a liberal because he naturally no blog. Uh, the blog would be no blog is complete unless you talk about fairness. You know, <laughs> so you know. That is what the NRA decal displayed in the rear window of your car tells me. Okay. And then he asked the question, is that fair? Well, I don't know. 
Because, you know, I, and, you know, people have been putting this quote up. Wow, I love that quote. We're not out to get him, but he's paranoid. Anyway. I wrote, uh, <laughs> fairness is for Democrats and five-year-olds, you know. <laughs> and basically, I stopped measuring fairness a long time ago when anti-gun agitprops stepped up their attacks and outright lies and manipulations and personal attacks. For their effort, nothing is ever left on the table. Okay, measures and standards of fairness are virtually non-existent. Unless it is the likes of me attacking some anti-gun measure. Then, and only then, does the crucible of fairness come into play. And it is I who stands accused of being unfair. Mm-hmm. So, Gee, paranoid much? That's a good quote, though. Wouldn't you agree? Fairness is for Democrats and five-year-olds. It is. Yes. <laughs> but here's the other thing. You talked about the redefinition of the language by progressives to suit their political whim. Absolutely. And we all know that they can't even call themselves the same name. They started off as progressives, screwed that name over, called themselves liberals. They screwed that name over. Now they're uh, calling themselves progressives. And now with the advent of um, Bernie, they're starting to finally say – we're, we've got to be socialists because, as Debbie Wasserman Schultz says... Democratic socialist. Bernie will correct you. Yes. Well, the problem is there's no not much of a difference because between he did. But my question to you is he also had a... You quoted him on the idea, well, what about my right to live freely without fear? And, and I look at that and... You know, that's part of the redefinition of the language. There's no you, such right. There is no yeah. such right. There, there is no such thing as no fear. You can minimize fear. You can minimize fear. We'd have by... to get rid of all the spiders. Yeah, yeah. Right, <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, is, should there be a government program to subsidize no, the homeowner who no, fears no, snakes no, or, and spiders? Or, or, or let me paraphrase a, f- a famous movie. Snakes. Why does it always have to be snakes? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Indiana Jones. You know, I, I mean, seriously. <laughs> People are... But I mean, why? Never give up. Never surrender. Hmm. What was the theme music to that, Steve? I don't know. I have the quote, though. Maybe we could have a government up. program. You know. Never surrender. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So, sure. I'm sorry. Especially, no, to I mean, the, especially to the EPA, but never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about what fear is. Hmm. Fear is an emotion, right? Yeah. I mean, is there is there a hoplifo Democrat out there who happens to be listening that would disagree with me? Fear. It's an emotion. It's not. It's none of our business what you're afraid of. That's for you to deal with. Oh, I right. like yeah. that. That's a good grok shot. Right, right, right. And and the other thing is is you, you, you run your life to make it as, as low fear as, as possible for yourself. You, what if you're afraid of government? Well, yeah, we well, are. What uh, about those people? Yeah, you, well, oh, we're then mentally... we arm ourselves. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. wait, wait, wait. You, no. If you look it up in the book, yeah, it's a mental disease. It's a well, they're, they're certainly trying to make it that way. What yeah. do you have to fear from your own government? <clears throat> well, I, you look at... Back in history, you well, look around you, you the world, you go, government, <laughs> yeah. there, it can be scary. Uh-oh, his tinfoil's got a hole in it. You know, I can hear them all now. You know? Well, then I ask, yeah. what is so different about the American government that would keep us from being oppressed by our own government? Especially now where we see day after day, the Supreme Court has said so, when our government refuses to play by its own rules. Absolutely. Yep. And that's the problem. That is the beginning of the end, when the rule of law is being we, pushed yeah. aside for political um, power. We, we, have, we have reached a point where the, the Constitution, which was the rule book for the government, is, is no longer seen by the governing class as applying to itself. Uh, and so the restraints which we thought we had on, on government have turned out to be, to be mythical. We thought we had a set of chains, and they turned out to be cotton, uh, you know, th- thin cotton yarns that have been snapped. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of the justices from long ago, once quipped, law is the witness and external deposit of our moral society. And if you think about what that quote is telling us, it's never more true today. Because, I mean, I look at I look at just our general state of lawlessness. Chris, Chris Christie, love him or hate him, he, he's got it right on that level. You know, our government is lawless. I mean, you know. Look how long ago Benghazi happened. You know, you got Hillary with the whole email thing. Nobody's being held accountable. No, and that is that is Fast correct. and Furious is still. Yep. You know, last year, Nobody's the Pam Geller event. That guy got a gun from the government. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lois Lerner. Lois Lerner. With the, Again, EP, the EPA, the yep. Interior Department, the DOT, HUD. 
I mean, we can go down the list of every single Most thing. Most of these are not necessary, and that is is perhaps the the hardest thing for you know the government fans to to grasp. These departments are not necessary. Yeah, it's it's just incredible. Yeah. Oh, did, was it you that posted the thing where the uh, some wag had got the wrong NRA, or was that on Twitchy? Uh, somebody had used the logo for the National Recovery Administration. Oh, that wasn't me. No. And said some past president of the NRA was against guns. Well, yeah. Yeah, of, National uh, Recovery of Roosevelt's uh, National Recovery <laughs> wasn't uh, that a, Administration. A Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Sure was. You know, sure was. Yeah, 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 yeah. It yeah. was. It's always the progressives that want to take the guns away. Guns, oh. what's not to hate? And remember, know? progressives are nothing more than socialist. I didn't yep. finish. And that they love really. guns. They love guns. But only they love guns. As long as they're the ones using them to oppress you. Correct. You know the other aspect of this blog that he wrote, you know, he takes a fairly common liberal tack, you know, it's the accusatory pointing finger. And he writes, "You would rather risk lives Thousands more than take responsible action. Now, what the hell is that? Responsible action. You know, what does he mean? He doesn't define that, you know. So, you know, it's an emotional rant. But I can clearly understand why people reacted the way he did. I mean, the guy had to shut his comments down first. And then he had to shut the whole blog down, you know. (laughs) You know, you can only read the blog now if you get a special, special invitation. And if you're a card-carrying member of Moms Demand Action, I bet it's open right now. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. You know, Bloomies and all those folks have probably got uh, free unfettered access. But we've also, one of the things this blog demonstrates, you know, first he shuts down the comments. Now he's shut down the entire blog so nobody can get to it except by, I don't know what, username and password or something given by him. Uh Freedom Debate. of speech is dead. Yeah, debate's not an option on this issue, no. apparently. Well, no. let me kind of knit for a little bit. The freedom of speech in the First Amendment has nothing to do with us in civil society. It was always government doing mm-hmm. it. So if he doesn't want to talk, he certainly has the freedom of silence as well. If he oh, doesn't, sure. If no. he doesn't want to debate, that's cool. But it, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. They refuse to engage because they can't win the logical argument. They have the emotional part, as you well put it, yeah. uh, but they can't go after the logical stuff. They they hate the stats. You know, On Megyn Kelly the other night, they had Dana Loesch and some other person, and they were screaming at each other. And Dana Loesch is ticking off stat after stat after stat, and the other person was doing the... I want my freedom from fear, kind of. Yeah, yeah, it's just losing our mind, basically. And it comes down to, and it really is, folks, we're orthogonal. We do not meet them. They do not meet us. It's almost like we do need to be separate countries because there is no compromise between the two. Right. It's an either or, binary on or off kind of deal with respect to almost everything. And I got news for you. This country cannot last that long with without that. You you gave that quote, and you know I'd love for you to put that up as a notable quote up on the Grok, um, because the moral part. Oh, we yeah. don't yeah. have a common morality anymore. Right. What right. we used to see as traditional American values, including gun ownership, is I'm gone. Ahead. Going to break soon. I yeah. finish your thought. Off. Finish your thought. No, I'm done. I'm You're done. done. Because yeah. I'd go along if I can. I know going. you could, you, but you, you reckon can also if we heave off the East Coast and call it Liptopia, that the rest of the country would be a conservative? We'd have to move. Well, yeah. you know, this these debates are about winners and losers. That We didn't set those rules. They did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? So I'm more than willing to make it about winners and losers, as long as they're the losers. All right. Well, <laughs> we're, they, we're will absolutely. Be. they will be the losers. We're going to start turning microphones off because we're going to go off here in a couple seconds. A little five-minute uh, shindig at the top of the hour, and we'll be back uh, if Max shows up on time. If not, we'll just keep talking to Rick because, you know, what the heck? That's what we're here for. Here to have a little conversation. I'm Steve McDonald here with Skip Murphy, Mike Rogers, Rick Olson. We are Grok Talk, and we will be right back in a few minutes. Stay tuned. Don't go away. We're still here. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Dread at Large in the Morning. The Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW New Hampshire Family Radio and available 24-7 live or archived 
at gerardatlarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Feel the power. Oh, I can feel it. Our moment of triumph approaches. <laughs> it's Rock Talk. This is a coalition of New Hampshire taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Flashback. Uh, we will have to talk to the proprietor of the office space and go, which hole do we use? Yeah, I hate, I hate it when you have to say that. The... Um, <laughs> We should go back, I think, so talking of college, to the scheme whereby not only do the parents help their kids, but there are no government subsidies, and let the colleges compete for the best kids by offering scholarships to those that are the best kids. That's crazy talk. <laughs> <laughs> There's Steve, always with the smart remark. That'll work, too. <laughs> That's why they won't do it. It'll work. You know, at their core. I mean, society can scope. Right, so about three squirrels ago. <laughs> <laughs> GraniteRock.com is a product of GraniteRock.com. Grok Talk is a product of GraniteRock.com. I just love this idea of how they're going to go to a bourbon festival or several bourbon festivals in Kentucky because that's where the young people go. So, first we'll get them drunk, and then we'll hook them onto Obamacare. What a country! As the old uh, Russian poet Pushkin said, where there is a trough, there will be pigs. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, you guys have a great sense of humor. I mean, no matter how much ribbon I do, even that uh, airbrush marine you have there, he, he, no matter how much uh, ribbon I give you guys, you guys always... You always come back for more, and you're always polite. And, you know, I go to the liberal websites where I have a lot of fun haranguing them, and uh, <laughs> they really get their panties in a walk. And I'm always, I'm always getting kicked off, and I have to make a new name, and uh, it's brutal. <laughs> yeah, it, and they're wrong. Yeah, she, it's almost like saying their crap don't stink. <laughs> I was about to say that, say the same thing. Their poop don't stink, but you know. <laughs> That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Here on Grok Talk, we have crap, we have poop, we have monster trucks. Okay. <laughs> we have come pretty but that, close but, to but, the but, end of this segment. Good, that, good. But uh, that, yeah, but, things but, are deteriorating. Grok Talk. Grok Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrok.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, The Rock, NHCR.com. Grok Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Rock Talk. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. The 603 Alliance held its second training seminar on Tuesday, August 11, 2015 at St. Anselm's Institute of Politics. And despite the heavy storms throughout the area, the turnout was fantastic. After introductions and a brief overview of who the 603 Alliance and CVL New Hampshire LLC are, the training focused on the first in the state 603 Grassroots Presidential Caucus to be held on Saturday, October 17, 2015 at the Hopkinton Fairgrounds. Procedures for the caucus were discussed and a call to action for volunteers to help on event day was met with great enthusiasm. 
almost everyone volunteered to help. And thanks to our wonderful friends from Massachusetts who have offered their assistance as caucus marshals. If you could not make the training seminar this week and would like to volunteer your time, please download the GPS Caucus sign-up form available at 603alliance.org. There are instructions on the site for where to send the form. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Silence, heathens. Max is in the room. Welcome back to Grok Talk. I'm Steve McDonald here with Skip Murphy, Mike Rogers, Rick Olson, and Max Abramson has just joined us. Uh, we wanted to let you know that uh, if you did miss the live show, you sh- should be listening to us on Spreaker or Stitcher or TuneIn or iHeart or iTunes. We're even on YouTube. We're also on Ustream. And, of course, uh, The Rock, NHCR.com is streaming us live this morning. I have confirmation in our rebroadcast on that channel is at 1 o'clock on Monday. So you can check us out again there, and we hope you do, uh, because we bring all these nice people in to talk about all these cool things. We want you to hear the conversation. And, you know, if you didn't didn't catch our our, uh, impromptu rendition of the theme to Indiana Jones, you really missed out. I'm sorry, you know, but you can listen to the podcast and, and check it out. So... You called us heathens. Heathens, we are heathens. No, we're not. No, heathens. we're not heathens. To the to the to the secularists, we are. Oh, for them, we are true believers. Great phrase, by the way, and I don't remember where I picked it up. I think I got it from Ace via somebody else. But he, they were talking about um, they were talking about speech and uh, in general, and um, you know the new there used to be blasphemy laws, you know, and now there's basically secular blasphemy laws. You know, the entire PC coalition, the entire things you can't say and things you can't do and things you can't display and all that other stuff. It's it's the new secular blasphemy. So it's it's just as oppressive to the free expression of ideas. It's just controlled by the government instead, <laughs> you know. So it's a great it's a great phrase, secular blasphemy. And there's a lot of it, and we'll be we'll be talking about it um, if uh, Stella Morbido manages to call in. She uh, had some 10 keys for getting around that kind of stuff. We want to talk about that if we have time. But Max has joined us, and uh, we want to talk about HB 603, which you can explain to our listeners, sir. Well, I'm a co-sponsor for HB 603. All it does is codify and guarantee that parents have the right to <clears> – <throat> Uh, take their child out of these annual assessments. Uh, these assessments are officially two hours, but I was doing a little bit of research online, and a few teachers have had their students come in and take these online assessments, and these assessments sometimes take some students so long that they actually wear out their laptop battery. So in theory, you can bring your lap, your child can bring their own laptop in and take the test that way. There's an online website. You log in. I decided to do the little guest test thing it took me about 10 minutes to get through all the little click on this click on this click on this and one of the complaints that the the teachers are having is there's a very very long security agreement that they have to read and sign before they can administer these assessment tests and they can't be there they can't watch the child they can't supervise them it has to be totally independent um, and the child has to be separate from instructors and whatnot now these assessments people say well we have to measure the aptitude and skills of of our children but in fact these annual federal assessments don't measure math skills and they don't measure reading skills and they don't measure any of that stuff what they're looking for is the child's opinions attitudes and beliefs it's kind of like a psychological review and some parents have raised concerns about the questions because a lot of these questions for assessments and smarter balance assessment and pace tests and whatnot the questions are um, being developed in secret and the questions are secret and the parents are not allowed to know what they are and they're slowly revealing some of the questions and they, it, views, it, it, it reads like a psychological survey so they're, they're, they're really getting into the nitty gritty of what are your personal beliefs about things so this is more akin to what we've seen in colleges being taught to teachers, you have to have a certain disposition. That's the key word here. You have to have a certain disposition to be able to be a teacher. You have to have a certain 
disposition to be a social worker. And we have seen Christians, uh, Bible-believing people or people of faith, being thrown out of these uh, college studies because they've been adjudicated not to be, as Steve said, secular enough and not willing to go along with things. So we're seeing the people who own the keys to the gates of a an occupation do that. Now they're bringing it down to our children in public school. And I think you're right, Max. It really is a case of they are keeping the parents away from the kids in doing this. They're discrediting the, the parents. And how is a parent supposed to fight this when they don't know what's on the test? I mean, is there a way for a parent to get this information because it's all computer generated, it's all computer given? How can a parent nowadays get this to read it for themselves? Do they have the ability legally to get it? Well, and that isn't clear to me yet. I mean, we've, we've been doing as much research as we can on this, but we can't get access to it. Parents are telling us they can't get access to it. They're asking us how to get access to it. Teachers might not have access to it. So we don't even know if we're allowed to have access to some of these questions where, you know, of course, my big thing is pushing political advocacy in the public schools is one of the things I've been fighting against in my district out on the seacoast. And I, I hear, you know, almost every single door I go to, they're pushing left-wing political advocacy in the public schools. And you listen to people, and it's amazing. It's, a, it's amazing how far it's gone, how extreme it's gone. And so we would like to look at the tests and see if there's a left-wing bias on some of these assessments. Now, these aren't the only assessments. This is just one. This is just one per year. There's a teacher who posted online. He said 27 days a year of classes. 27 days are eaten up by standardized testing, just by testing, not teaching. And you've got more and more teachers now upset saying, hey, less testing, more teaching. If you look at the, the absolute top schools in Europe, they're in Finland, the, the absolute top of the board when they finally do their end of the career, you know, high school graduation, standardized tests, standardized European tests. It's Finland. Well, Finland doesn't do any standardized testing. In fact, there's very little testing going on in the schools at all, all the, except what the teachers decide to come up with. Right. I mean, I, I remember more a case of uh, the teachers would do you quizzes on the stuff they were teaching you to make sure they were getting it through. Mm -hmm. um, Why do you I, need a master's degree to proctor a test that you can't even be in the room? I don't get that. That makes no yeah. sense to me. Well... Um, and the salary to go with that. The union today. officials are now, in in my experience, the public sector union officials are becoming more and more liberal, socialist, communist, whatever you want to call them. Politically, they're way out there. And I've talked to other guys at the union hall and even other, even other, you know, union agents and whatnot. People have been union men and women for all their lives, and they're yeah. talking to the public sector union officials, and they are so liberal. And they are so defensive of left-wing politics and socialism and the Democratic Party. There was a guy that spoke at the 603 Alliance Grassroots Summit from New Zealand. Was oh, talking, yeah. He wrote a book about it. yeah. He wrote a book about how the, the socialists took over the unions. Yeah, oh. and the, that's the, why the, they're like that. The enemies that. within it's called, yeah. and he's got he's got a full size DVD of it as well. People uh, forget the uh, American Federal Federation of Labor under Samuel O. Gompers back in the day when unions were real unions. Uh, they were very much anti-communist, anti-socialist. They kept the socialist ad activists out because they found they didn't do anything. You get them on the job and they didn't do anything except, you know, go on and on and on and talk all day like we are so, right now. So when was Samuel Gompers? <laughs> Give me the bit of U.S. Uh, history. Uh, he, was, he was a cigar guy. Ronald Reagan called Samuel Gompers probably the greatest union organizer in American history. He first got started, I think, in 1881 with the Cigar Makers Union. Yeah. Um, and he really started to think more and more about this as he had a very clear idea for what the union's position was, what its place was in the economy to represent the uh, workers. Um, and let us remember back then, he, even the leftist president, uh, FDR, thought that uh, government unions were a really bad idea and should never be allowed. Right. Well, and. One of the things I used to write about years ago was, was about the SEIU. They were taken over by socialists. And person after person after person who were president of locals or regionals or at the national level were part of the socialist communist parties. Mm -hmm. And with the post I put up this past week, here's the 1963 
uh, goals of the Communist Party, and one of them was explicitly, and that had been around for a long time, was to take over the unions. And indeed, they're very blunt about it. You go to Chicago with the teachers' unions. The head of the teachers' union says, flat out, I'm a socialist. End of story. And you look at this stuff, and it's certainly not our world as we grew up anymore. Someone told me that all 44 of Obama's policy czars, drugs, transportation, whatever, all of them are openly socialist or communist, and all of the people surrounding the Obamas are openly socialist and communist. Well, I remember and when... It's just it's just the way that they are. Those are the yeah. ones that aren't openly Iranian. Yeah, I remember <laughs> when... Uh, I was thinking that. <laughs> when Anita Dunn said that one of her... her uh, the people she looked up to was Mao Zedong. And she said it in a church at a gathering and then realized afterwards what she had just done. It was what has been called a gaffe, the telling of the truth inadvertently. Or, as you, we were talking about, unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. You know, right. I have one question about these kids taking these tests. When does it devolve to a point where they're sitting at the laptop taking the test and they get an electric shock if they answer incorrectly? You know? <laughs> I mean, we, <laughs> I mean I had, it's all uh, got to be headed in that direction, you know? <laughs> I had a college professor recently. Uh, I had a college professor recently. They're asking your impression of certain things. You know, it's your impression. Well, why are they asking me my impression of something, of some reading? And I would write, well, this is more, you know, divisive left-wing political advocacy, and it's pushing more of the same tired old victim class and entitlement this and that. And he didn't like it. He gave me – he marked me down. He gave me 50 percent, so he failed me on that assignment because – and he said he didn't like my response. Well, he, the question is just – they're just asking me for my opinion, my impression of this. And I said, this is my impression of that story. It's more left-wing advocacy. This is why we need more kids with cameras. And it would have been perfect to be able to say, you asked me my opinion. I gave you my opinion. Now you're telling me my opinion is wrong, but it's my opinion. All right. We're going to take a really, really, really short break. And we'll be right back as soon as I get done pushing all these buttons. Hang on. Stay tuned. We're here. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Rock Talk comes to you live almost every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrock.com. You can also listen live at Spreaker.com. If you missed a live show, catch up with the podcast at GraniteGrock.com, Spreaker.com, on Stitcher Radio, at iTunes, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio, and now on The Rock, New Hampshire's Christian radio station, The Rock and HCR.com. Rock Talk is a mobile-ready broadcast, so you can listen anywhere anytime on your PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Rock Talk. Rock Talk. If you didn't know, I'm Steve McDonald. To my left, we have Skip Murphy. At the end of the table, we have Mike Rogers. To his left, we have Max Abramson. And to his left, and we're all on the right, by the way... Richard Olson. <laughs> Are you going to put that Thanks. on before I turn it on so I don't hear this? <laughs> okay, let's go microphone. Nobody gets to the right of this group. That's right. So <laughs> to them, to my right, Rick Olson, Max Abramson, <laughs> and Mike Rogers, who's right at the end of the table, and Skip Murphy. That makes me most rightest. That makes you the most rightest. Or the most righteous. Or, but you're immediately to my left, which is... Not All right. The most righteous <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> yes, sir. Before I forget, I used to live in Manchester Ward Five, and I went around and doorbell and doorbell and doorbell, and I went through almost the entire district after. I one remember or two that. Hmm. Rich is in my district, or was in my district. I no longer live there, um, but it was solidly Democrat, always Democrat. And I kept going door to door, and I'd find some fiscally conservative Democrats and independents. A lot of people didn't vote because they thought it was hopeless, pointless. And yet going door to door, we saw voter turnout increase every year that I was doing, mm -hmm. going door to door, saying, hey, we can clean up the system. We can, we just need people to go out there and run. But 
that district kept losing. We, we could never get Republicans elected. And I finally ran into Norma Greer Champagne, who did get elected finally last yep. year, and uh, a couple of years ago. And the reason was you had all these nice old ladies in this in this old kind of lower Terry Town Road. Yep. Yep. These apartments, probably 300 voters, almost every single one voted Democrat because they just continue to believe that the Democrats are the party of Harry Truman and are going to help people one day. And the vast majority of them don't pay attention. So what's happened with a lot of those districts is Republicans have given up on those districts. Mm -hmm. And they just don't go there. And yet it turns out, sure enough, if you campaign and campaign and campaign, of course, eventually those nice old ladies, they're in their 70s and 80s, um, some of them will change their mind. Some of them will move on, and some of them will pass, pass on, away. Expire. But that that district eventually, the people can get back control over their legislative district. Eventually, even those really tough inner city, inner Manchester. If you ever look at the, Manchester, the blue red map, all around the outside, it's all Republican on the mm -hmm. extremes, and then right in the center, it's all solidly Democrat. Well, sure enough, if you campaign in those areas, eventually over time, it, it, it can become competitive again. But 90% if you, of success is just showing up. But if you don't doorbell, we've seen this in uh, – I, I spoke to a Republican who was, used to live in Connecticut, and he said he, they had this solidly almost two-to-one Democrat neighborhood. And he and a couple of others uh, went around and went – doorbelled and doorbelled and doorbelled, and they showed that, you know, these Republicans, they're workers. And, and – you know, once you do that, if you've done that enough, eventually you swing that district. And that district went from solidly Democrat to solidly Republican. And then gradually, because it's socially liberal and, and so forth, because the media effect, gradually over time the numbers go down and down and down and down and down. And what's happened in a lot of our, our, our cities that used to vote Republican, remember about 10 or 15 years ago, half of all mayors in this country were Republican. Now they're all Democrat. It's so solidly polarized now. Um, and, you know, when Ronald Reagan ran, uh, he won every state in the nation except for, I think, was it Wisconsin or Minnesota or something? I think Minnesota. Can't remember. Washington, D.C. It was one of those, yeah. In 80 and 84, in 1980, he lost a few southern states. In 84, he picked them all up. He won every state in the nation. He won 40% of the vote in New York City. So people think that, well, you know, you have these lefty areas and the left controls things, but they really don't because, you know, that saying from Star Wars, the more you... Squeeze your fingers. The more you tighten down, the more systems will slip through your grasp. People don't like being crushed. The union guys especially don't like having the, the heavy-handed approach that the union officials take when they push the socialist agenda. So um, people just – they don't like the rigidness. They hate the political correctness, and Donald Trump really tapped into this. He said this political correctness has got to stop. That's the lo loudest standing ovation that he's gotten on the whole – you know, campaign trail, at least was, for debates. Uh, it when was, I was at that education summit, the uh, governors were talking about a lot of the reforms they did. And, of course, you have Scott Walker, who completely turned his state around. You've got, you know, everybody was fighting with the unions. And, and you know, they would talk about trying union to officials. get school choice. and try, Yeah, but union bosses, you know. Uh, they're talking about school choice and vouchers and homeschooling and all these things that we, we talk about. And we're like, these things all make perfect sense. The teachers don't necessarily oppose it. The the parents don't oppose it. The students don't oppose it. But it, the union bosses do. And so you'll go in and you'll force these reforms through where you can. And then you know they would talk about how sometimes teachers would be like, "Thank you." You know, <laughs> you know? a lot. You know, go to Ward Five where I live. There's a few aspects that people don't really realize. But I mean, did you folks know that Ward Five Manchester is home to one of the state's largest employers? Did you know that? Oh, Elliot, I didn't Elliot know Health I System. used to live there. Yeah, <clears throat> Elliot, Elliot Hospital and Associated Health Systems. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,600 people they employ. Yeah. It's one of the state's largest employers, right in Ward 5. You know, one of the, one of the big problems I ran, I just recently ran for alderman in Ward 5, and I knew, I was, I knew things were lost because uh, <clears throat> one of the things about some of these inner city wards is if you're born there and you grow up there and you run for office, you got it made. People know who you are. You know, I was running against uh, Tony Sapienza, and uh, needless to say, he got crushed. You know, I got crushed. And I, I, I ran a campaign, not a strong campaign, but a campaign. Got signs, went door to door a few times, but 
you know. I, I mean, I didn't even have the benefit of, of my my father growing up in that ward to, to fall back on. But, you know, in the case of the Sapienza brothers, they all they grew up there. Um, and then, um, you know, big union guy, leftist Democrat. The other problem with Ward 5 is it's very transient. You got people moving in, people moving out. Um, we're back down now to five or six hundred people deciding who the alderman is or who the selectman is. People are not voting in that ward. I mean, it kind of goes in trends and cycles, you know, and one of the biggest troubles they have in Manchester with purging and updating and revising lists is Ward 5. I mean, because it is so transient. It's a tough, tough ward. More so than 4, 3, 2, or 1. I want to go back to uh, SB 603. Uh, HB. Could. HB. HB. Yep. So this is about parental rights, the ability to pull your child out of this assessment. And what's the chance of it getting the veto override that Maggie the Red Hassan put on it? Well, there are actually uh, 20 to 30 Democrats. Probably all of the Republicans will vote for the veto override. Depends on how many actually show up. Um, but there are about 20 to 30 Democrats who are not really in lockstep with the party. So there are 160 Democrats, about 100 and 140 of them just do as they're told every single time. But there are maybe 20, 27, somewhere in there, who voted with us on school choice, voted with us on uh, charter schools, HB 563, and they're not really in lockstep with the teachers' union officials and the school administrators, school superintendents. So there are some Democrats there in the House. Now, when you get to the Senate side, if it does pass the House, gets to the Senate side, it's going to be tougher because you've got 24 state senators. We need to get 16 to get two-thirds. We have 14 Republicans. Probably all the Republicans will vote for parental rights and probably, unfortunately... Even Nancy Stiles? Um, and I pick on her because she is the most Democrat-like... Only on senator that we've got. Only on education issues, on all and maybe abortion, taxing, Obamacare, well, Medicaid expansion, guns, guns. If you look at her actual, well, I don't know. I, when you look at her actual voting record, it's always B, B minus, C plus. But it's hard because they take so many voice votes. We don't get the actual vote. Yeah, we had Paul on to talk about that. And it was, yeah. On, it's rough. on it's committee, rough it's, on on the education committee, we've noticed that she does really vote with the Democrats. However, if you take out the education issues, it's not that way. She really is. Yeah, she's. But this is an education issue. That's true. So we might lose Nancy Stiles. However, um, we've still got to we've still got to somehow pick up 16 votes to get this passed. And it's just it's very simple. Um, the big lie that they're telling about this is that the feds will take these poor school districts with all these poor kids <clears throat> where too many parents are objecting, too many kids are refusing to take the test. And this is what we, we tell them. If the school administrators say, you have to take this test, the superintendents say, you have to take this test, we're, we're, we're telling the parents, just have your kids sit there for two hours. Christmas tree it. Don't, exactly, don't do the test. Just don't do it. All right. You need to call Kimberly. Yes. In Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I shall. Wake her up because it's only 830 there. I assume um, she doesn't have her dogs to wake her up. Oh, wait, her dogs sleep late. Anyway, we're going <laughs> to we're gonna take a break. And uh, Max, stick around. Uh, we could be having a couple phone calls coming in. You never know. But we're going to call Kimberly, get an update from the Economic Summit in Jackson, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where we wanted to go but couldn't because we all had other things we had to do and couldn't. Man, I wanted to go out there bad. I have never yeah, been to like Wyoming. Work. It would have been. Well, yeah, jobs and junk. So uh, hang in. We will be right back. Let me turn that up because that'll help. Stay tuned. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. 
the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Skip's got chocolate on his fingers. Hey, welcome back to Grok Talk, brought to you by the bloggers at and the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. Finger licking, uh oh, now we got we got uh, Stella calling in too. Hang on, let me put you uh, line one on that. Hold on a second. Kimberly, you might have to hang on, baby. Uh, we are brought to you, uh, I already said that part. Don't forget to check us out on Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and iTunes. You can uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we are on YouTube and Ustream, and we are on the rock, nhcr.com. So Skip is bringing on our, our other guest, and uh, hang on a second, I gotta say, Kimberly, just stay on the line, hun. <laughs> hun, don't you like it when you go to the Dunkin' Donuts drive through and they go, here's your change, hun. All right, uh, we have uh, Stella Morbido from The Federalist. Welcome to the show. Oh, hang on. There we go. Let's try that. Good morning. Good morning. How, How are, are you doing? Good. How are you? Fine, thank you. So I'm so glad we could get you on the show. Let me uh, make a couple adjustments here. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Stella's a senior writer at The Federalist. She's got a, a nice nice bio if you want to check it out, but I don't want to spend too much time on that because uh, some of these articles that you write, I, I kind of discovered you recently, and I've been going through it, and she talks about the, the culture and political correctness and, and these I just and you had this list: ten key ways to break the mass delusion machine. So you just tell us real quick what the mass delusion machine is, and uh, then let's go through your list. Okay. Well, you know, it's uh, mass delusion is just a product of political correctness, which, as you all know, is a kind of a, a regime, a policy. Uh, you know that that uh, calls on everybody to shut up about certain opinions. Or just to shut up if it do, if your opinion doesn't match up with uh, the uh, the dictates of uh, you know what what political correctness requires you to think and to say, um, and that cuts off uh, conversation. I mean, it just basically ends up separating us as human beings and cutting off conversation, cutting off civil discourse, which is very damaging to any kind of a democracy. So. Um, uh, so I guess your your key question was, uh, you know, how to break through it. And I, I guess the, the first thing we have to do is be aware of what's going on. And uh, what's going on really is that our, our fears are being manipulated, and every human being has a primal, uh, deep-seated fear, I believe, of being uh, separated from others because as social animals we basically don't survive uh, in separation from others. So, um, you know, this is just this kind of fear just kind of kicks in and uh, before you know it, everybody's kind of in a lemming-like state. Um, but anyway, if you want to, I, I don't want to keep rambling on about that, but uh, if you had a follow-up. Oh, no, you can you can ramble. I want to go through these 10 points you made because I, I think everybody needs to read this. And that's true. We've talked about this. Well, we talk about it every week. We talk about the PC culture. We talk about, you know, as conservatives, as right-wing conservatives, we regularly confront this this liberal wall of silence, which um, we borrowed the term. Um, um, I lost the phrase. What did I say earlier? Uh, secular. S- secular. Oh, um, uh, Oh, no. Censorship. Censorship. Well, it was a form of censorship. It was um, 
a blasphemy, secular blasphemy, violating that. And I don't know if I picked that up from you or somewhere else, but I read it online, and I'm like, that's exactly what it is. You know, we used to have blasphemy laws, and people oh. were like, well, we can't have that. That's not right. That stifles debate. And now we have secular blasphemy, and, and it's very real. And, and you have this list um, of ten things that you put down, that, and, and I think people need to read it because they need to understand. So the first one is drop political correctness. Yes. I mean, we, we just need to be aware that it's, a, it's, all, it's just basically propaganda compliance is, is what it's about. <laughs> it's, and it's not easy for everybody to do based on their circumstances or what kind of a job they're in or if they work for some big corporation that, uh, you know, uh, would fire them if they, you know, said certain things. Um, so obviously everybody has their own situation, but um, we need to be aware uh, of what it is and what it does to us. And, um, and, and then I think it's really important for everybody to understand what this is doing to personal relationships. Uh, you know, as the culture becomes more and more polarized and people are unable to think even of the other side as, you know, actually even human, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, it really has a, um, uh, a negative force on or effect on, uh, on personal relationships. A lot of people don't even feel they can express in a very gentle way to their neighbor or classmate or coworker or whatever that, oh, you know, that they're Christian or that they're um, a, uh, you know, have a different opinion on, say, the marriage issue or uh, gender identity or whatever. And this is really dangerous stuff. So anyway, it separates us, and, 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 it, and, it, and it leads to something called the spiral of silence that causes, uh, it gets out of control because people start thinking that their opinion is totally isolated, that nobody else, there's nobody else out there who sees the world as they do, and and this is a recipe for mass isolation and separation, and you know that leads to mass delusion. I know I'm probably rambling uh, on a lot of kind of, you know. Uh, now, these are these are connected. As realized personal relationships are the target is number two. Human separation is the end result of political correctness is number three, uh, and then um, uh, fear fuels the machine. I mean, these are all things that people don't. I mean, this is what you do. This is your meat and potatoes, this, the, the relationships, the, the culture. I mean, if you go to your website um, and, and read some of these articles, it's really all about that. And, and, and people think about PC as this kind of offhanded kind of way of controlling the way people behave, but they don't think about it at the depth of personal relationships. They don't, right. they don't think that, you know, what you just said, and, and it's, it's right here in number two, you say, you know, if you don't think your personal relationships are a target, then answer this question. How free do you feel? to express your non-PC ideas to a coworker, classmate, or neighbor. You just said this. And you begin to think about how much you begin to self-limit your own speech and how deliberate exactly. this whole process is. It yeah. is. It's an old, it's an ancient divide and conquer kind of recipe. It, it's, and, uh, and yet, it, but it's happening on, because of, um, you know, social media and everything, it, it starts to happen on a very, very personal level. And, um, so, you know, and, and if we're ignorant of it, and that's my number five point, mm -hmm. uh, that allows uh, this thought reform, which is what political correctness is about. Once you control the language, language is just symbols for thoughts. You start controlling thought. It's very Orwellian. Uh, you can read about that in 1984. Um, and, and um, you know, so language, uh, controlling the language helps, you know, controls thoughts. And uh, it causes people to self-censor, and uh, and that of course leads to what I call number six, coerced silence, uh, killing democracy. I mean, if if we don't use free speech, we lose it. It is a use it or lose it proposition, and we need to remember that. And of course, everybody has their own limitations, their own situation in life. I mean, you don't want I don't want anybody to lose their job because they blurt out something that'll get them fired, uh, but we need to remember these things as we navigate and uh, navigate this um, uh, nasty little maze that, that we've been put in through political correctness. Um, and, you know, it has to be resisted as best as we can. Uh, and it's the only way. Um, and it has to be done, I think, 
gently and kindly on a one-on-one, that is the best way, actually, because the the powers that be, or whatever you want to say, um, uh, already have the, um, you know, all the outlets. Uh, if you look at, you know, media, Hollywood, academia, the unions, uh, all of these communications outlets. So, but one-on-one uh, personal relationships, when you think about it, uh, when you look at the end result, you know, you go all the way down the line to the end result of this sort of thing, where you end up in, say, North Korea. You, you, you see where people, um, you know, are, have great distrust in a society that ends up kind of a surveillance society. So anyway, um, I would, anybody who hasn't looked at Václav Havel's book or essay, The Power of the Powerless, um, that really illuminates uh, all of this, the fact that just one person can have just a ripple effect. The ripple effect is really uh the big prize of those pushing political correctness. Absolutely. One of the things we see this manifested in is this whole Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, that one's off the rails. I was having a discussion with an individual, and the individual, you know, I said, oh, the whole Black Lives Matter, you know, black people. He says, oh, you can't say black people. You have to say African American. And I, my correction to him was, really now? So if you have a black person that flies to an African nation and he's at the the uh, immigration at the uh, you know the customs place and he has to fill out a questionnaire and it requires his race does he put african american i don't think they have that there so there's these all these misnomers and things we trip over you know w- with all this pc speech and i think pc speech is dangerous when it bubbles into our our, our operation of how we govern ourselves and how we live our lives it's terrible it, it, well, it is, because then what that does is it separates us from uh, other people just uh, based on, say, that, you know, that's just one example. Uh, you know, you, you'll have things like trans lives matter as though nobody else is. It's not that as though nobody else is, does. I think that what happens is we end up uh, having to, like you said, trip over all of our language, and uh, and, and you'll see... Um, a lot of this in, like, the transgender uh, protocols, the pronoun protocols uh, that are very, very confusing for people, like the Bruce Jenner thing, you know. Um, and, uh, and again, that's just another, uh, another kind of language control thing going on. But when you dig really, really deep, um, what you're dealing with there is uh, cultivating a sense of grievance that a lot of people, that, that people develop because, um, I think what it comes right down to is uh, when people feel that their dignity has been assaulted, uh, as, you know, the history in this, in this country, uh, you know, slavery and Jim Crow and all of that, um, it, it's very easy for divide-and-conquer elites to try to cultivate that, instead of healing, um, you know, cultivate uh, um, the kind of, you know, sense of having your dignity assaulted and, uh, you know, when people don't really mean to do that. So, yeah, it creates a lot of, um, a, a lot of <laughs> dissent, dissension. I mean, a lot of, uh, uh, it sows a lot of seeds of uh, separation in society instead of a true community in which people you know, get along and, uh, and are, you know, live in harmony, what you've got are these slogans that are really meant to cultivate separation. And, and it really is. It's horrible. So uh, the thing to remember is one person just reaching out to another has a lot of, a lot of power. Um, and freedom, really, there is a strong link between freedom and friendship. And then I go into number nine, surprising validators, and those are the people who might have have non-PC views, but uh, most people wouldn't expect them to. Like maybe you know a social worker, as I do, a couple, uh, or a psychiatrist, as I do, a few, who um, uh, have non-PC views, but, you know, they can't, they, they, they don't feel they can speak out uh, because... Um, they, um, you know, they'll, they'll be crucified in the public square. However, 
they're not alone, but they feel they're alone. If they do speak out, they, their voice has, like, huge uh, impact. Um, and anyway, you'd have to read that in my piece, because that's based on uh, something that Cass Sunstein wrote. Uh, he, he's the one who came up with that term, and he's, you know, of course, he worked for the Obama administration. Uh, but, uh, you know, he would know because he's all into this behavior modification thing. So finally, I would say that it's really important to engage and not self-cocoon and, and let people see the human face of conservatism. And uh, the more they see that, the more we, you know, uh, we, can, we can fight against these noxious effects of political correctness. Well, Stella, thank you so much for coming on and spending some time with us. I appreciate you uh, squeezing us into your morning. I know you're busy. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Take care. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. All right, we're going to take a really short break. We're going to come back. Hopefully Kimberly Morin is still on the line, and we'll have a little conversation with her. This is Grok Talk. Stay tuned. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. You want to read that? I do. He wants to read that. I do. All right. Because it's double plus ungood. Read it. Read it. This is from Rick. Reminded me of what I'd seen already. Wrote it on a post. If Bruce Jenner goes missing, will his face only appear on a carton of half and half? (laughs) Hey, Kimberly, are you still there? Hello? Kimberly. Bring on the correct line. I guess she hung up when she realized she could go back to sleep. I'll call her back. You can call her back, see if she wants to join us for the last last quarter, no. last quarter of the last hour. You know what I hate about politically correct people is they've got to get offended on behalf of other folks. <laughs> so they'll have a movie. All the black folks are, are laughing because they get it. Mm-hmm. They get the joke. But there's some politically correct person who's just got to shut off the laughter and be like, those folks, you just offended all these people. Ordinary people get it. Ordinary folks working folks they get the joke they get it. it's just something's just to play on words it's like being that uptight all the time I, they're grand, just angry they're perpetually aggrieved they're my ex- grandson asked me i was about you know, he was about 11 or 12 he asked me what what is political correctness and i told him it's a bunch of people who can't mind their own business <laughs> busy bodies <laughs> uh-oh i think she's mad at us right i'll have listen Oy vey. or she's trying to Maybe, Maybe she just went back to sleep. I told her if, 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 and, and I, well, I do feel bad because I wasn't really expecting the call. So Oy. that's just how it was. Oh, well. Anyway. Kimber. No. Kimberly, it's Skip. We're calling you back. I'm sorry we didn't talk to you. Please, please give us a call or we'll call you back in a couple of minutes. We're so sorry. There you go. On the air. There so uh, I want to, since we were on the subject, um, I'm going to turn this music off and play this thing that Skip posted from Colin Quinn. Riotously <laughs> funny. Oh. And, and uh, here you go. But if you even mention ethnicity, people feel a little bit, ten- your stomach feels tense. If you even mention someone's ethnicity, everyone's like, wow, wow. If I told you a true story, this Mexican guy came up to me, ho, oh, whoa. <laughs> Why does this guy have to be Mexican in your true story? I don't understand. <laughs> you know, you have to speak in the most idealized, pasteurized, homogenized, colorblind at all. You know, you feel, bit- if you notice, you're like, this guy comes up to me, could have been Mexican. I don't know. I don't care. I shouldn't have been a Central American, Hispanic, Latino. It was a man, all right? Wait a minute. I was sexist. I don't know if it was a man. Could have been. 
a woman, it could have been LGBT, I don't know. I mean, it was a, a life form came up to me. You know what? Hold on. I'd like to uh, start the story by apologizing for, obviously, I'm coming from a place of Western entitled, unconscious, paternalistic fear of the other, and, um, you know, non heteronormative, gender specific. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that this apology has been a learning experience for me and a, you know, a teachable moment. And I think I'm going to do some soul searching and hopefully down the line, I can start a nonprofit for other people no, you gotta go to that are telling stories. You know. You've got the therapy. And, and on behalf of carbon based life forms, I'd like to apologize to all the other guys. Yeah. Sure, you applaud, but half the country, when you tell that apology, groveling, they're like, now you're starting to understand. So there you go. Yeah. My, my, <laughs> my response to that was, you precious snowflake, go back to mommy and daddy's basement and stay there until you can grow up, you leeching on society parasite. If you can't control your emotions, you don't deserve the title of grown up. You should go back to your cave sit there and meditate on the idea of we, the rest of us, do not exist just to make you feel happy feet. Mike, I'm getting mail from you during the show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what? <laughs> He's emailing us while we're, we're doing our thing. I'm, so anyway. I'm, I'm doing research, especially while stuff's playing, you know. Well, you know, Facebook is one of those mediums where you get to see the battleground experiment played out in all its angst. Yeah, um, that's true. Case in point, there's a there's a Facebook page called Manchester Happenings, mm-hmm. right. you know, so, and, and it's it's totally amazing because, you know, they put events going up, events that are going on in the community on Manchester Happenings. And it's it's really helpful. You see, you know, when Glendy's arriving and and when they're going to build the Walmart over on John Devine and, you know, and then all of a sudden the thread peters off into Walmart sucks. They don't pay a living <laughs> wage, hey, Kimberly, you know. Sucks. They go on and on and on uh, with with these uh, socialist rantings, you know, and it's not because it's an ideology or they're an advocate. It's because they're stupid. You know, they just they believe the stuff because of what they don't have. You know, totally amazing. Can I bring her on? Oh, I'm going to put the phone down, though, because it'll screw up the signal. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I bet you. That if that was happening in real life. <laughs> I know. I think I can think of a couple hundred thousand liberals who would just love for that to be a reality. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we only got a couple minutes, but uh, about seven minutes. But uh, so you're at Jackson Hole, Wyoming. You got the trip we didn't take because we could. <laughs> we all wanted to go, but we couldn't. Um, oh, you guys would have loved it too. It's it's, it's been fabulous. I, I, it really I know has. it's gorgeous out there. I don't know if I'm ever going to get out there, but hopefully they'll. I love the hunting. Yeah. There's nothing like <laughs> hunting in Wyoming. Yeah. Oh. Is that because the deer just walk up to you? Or? No. <laughs> They're all over the place. They might as they, they, they can. Yeah. They're so, a dime a dozen here. So, yeah, the uh, antelopes. You know. Let's talk about the, the summit real quick. we got a couple minutes. So basically the summit is, you know, discussing. They, they had it. It's during the same weekend as the Federal Reserve has theirs mm-hmm. every, every year. And, um, so they're having it and counter to that because, of course, the Fed never talks realistically or with fiscal sanity about monetary or fiscal policy. So they have this, they, they want to start it, they want to start the conversation basically. And more people, regular people, need to demand that presidential candidates even talk about this as well. Because we have a huge issue in this country. No one's addressing it. Everybody's kind of ignoring it. The Fed is afraid to deal with it and raise interest rates or whatever. Like, there's all kinds of things that are, that are going on and people don't understand that the Fed's policies are why we're in as much fiscal and trouble as we're in and why we feel it as individual people in our own pocket. Mike, this, is your, so this is your wheelhouse, <laughs> baby. Let's go. A- abs- absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, as you said, they're afraid to raise interest rates because every time they even talk about it, the market wobbles. And then anything, yep. any, anything anywhere else in the world, a butterfly wing flapping in China, and uh, it all comes crashing down. And it's, oh, my God, perhaps we can't l- raise interest rates after all. If they would just walk away and let the market determine the interest rates, uh, they would settle in at a realistic level fairly quickly. Yep. Unfortunately, the, the Fed seems to think it has to manage everything. And like any other kind of central, central planner, it messes it up. 
Yep, no, exactly. And and that's, you know, one of the things that they were discussing this weekend. And there's actually a couple um, guys from British Parliament here. So Which ones? That's, that's, um, I don't want to say his name wrong. One of them is Steve Baker, and the other one is Quasi Quartang. Okay. And they're from um, the British Parliament at your conference, not at the Fed's conference, of course. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. no, they're they're the good guys. They're on the good conference. So who else you got there? We might recognize. Oh, who else? Um, John Fun, Peter Schiff, um, Steve Moore, Steve Lonigan, pardon? Stephen Moore. Yep, Steve Moore was here. Um, let me see who else. There was a rep here, Rep um, Scott Garrett, who is a rep from New Jersey. Well, I don't know how he got elected in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good guy. <laughs> All the, all the Republicans really live in his district. That's all of them. <laughs> yeah, once, must be. Yeah, once you get out of, outside of the urban hell holes, it's mostly Republican. Yeah. Well, it's pretty much anywhere, right? Mm. Um, and then, of course, Jim DeMint. Um, he was the keynote speaker at dinner yesterday. Oh, fabulous. Um, and Jeffrey Tucker was here, is here talking about Bitcoin today and digital currency. You know him. Yep. Um, let's see. Um, Judy Shelton. She is from Atlas Network. I had not heard of her before, but she is fabulous. Um, she talked yesterday as well. Um, and then there's Mark Miles, who is a, a, an economist. I'm hoping to snag an interview with him today because he really he put he explained it so simply that even you know a fifth grader could understand it. You know, when you keep interest rates low, unemployment stays low. Uh, uh, employment stays low and well. Because uh, capital is cheaper than uh, it's cheaper to invest in capital than workers, so that's what companies are doing. They'll invest in that capital. What's his name again? Uh, Mark Miles, and he actually lives in Massachusetts. Oh, we're going to have to have him on the show. Is it M Y or M I? It's M A R C M I L E S. He is. He was really fabulous. I mean, a couple of us that are here. Yeah, um, a couple of us here were like, oh, my God, we have to interview him. Because that, that's what we need, is people like him to be able to, you know, he's, he's brilliant. He has all the knowledge, right? But if he can translate that into regular terms for regular people, um, because, you know, you mentioned Federal Reserve or quantitative easing to people, and they kind of gloss over like, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah translation's so, important for people like me who pay their visa with their MasterCard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So... So that's, you know, that for me, that's one of the takeaways from this weekend is to try to get that, you know, put that in English for people. Um, because, you know, none of the candidates are talking about this. And we're a first in the nation state. Let's make them talk about it. Well, that's a good I idea. Be oh, sorry, Rand, I turned you Rand off. Paul, sorry. sorry, I wouldn't be surprised if Rand Paul's talking about it because he and his mm-hmm. dad have been big uh, against the uh, the Federal Reserve and their machinations. Yeah, well, the big thing, the thing is that what they've talked about is end the Fed or audit the Fed, which is great, but people need to understand what the heck the Fed does and why it's hurting us. You, you can't yeah. just say, you know, these things, even though they, we might all agree with it. Let's explain to people why the Fed is bad. And, and regular and folks doing. are often against that end it thing. They want, they might be in favor of a gradual decrease in power. And, and some people say, well, you can't do that. you got to just cut it. But you're never going to just cut it. There, uh, it just seems like you're never going to have the people in power to do it. And so, yeah, sometimes you have to do like the progressives did, take little bites until you can get where you need to go and make progress where you can, you know. Yeah, right. I, don't, I don't know how you end the Federal Reserve gradually, although there are schemes for getting away from it. Uh, the bottom line is we haven't had sound money since the Federal Reserve was brought into being, uh, as evidenced by the devaluation of the dollar against we gold got about 20 under seconds. FDR. And, of course, we've especially not had it since Nixon uh, just uncoupled gold from the dollar altogether. Kimberly, we're going to have to cut you off because we got to go. The show's ending. All right, awesome. I have to go down to the the rest of the summit that starts at 9 o'clock. So all right, I'll we look forward to all your... Yeah, we want your updates and emails and, and posts and some whatever you got. So thanks so much for you coming got on. It. And we'll see you next week. All see right, we'll Bye, see guys. You. Bye. All right, this is Grog Talk. I'm Steve McDonald here with Skip Murphy, Mike Rogers, Max Abramson, and our good friend, Mr. Olson, Mr. Richard Olson. And we're done. We'll be back next week. Have a good weekend. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal.
So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Rock. 